Hello, thanks everyone. Um, it's a really incredible um, event, and I just want to thank the O Culture and everyone for such an amazing um, set of papers here. Um, so my presentation is called How We Were Never Post-Human, Techniques of the Post-Human Body in Pamela Z's Voci. Um, so it's, this is her large-scale multimedia work, um, this 80-minute performance, which the artist describes as a polyphonic mono-opera, consists of a series of scenes that combine the voice with digital video and audio processing. Z manipulates these sources using the body synth, um, an alternate controller interface that converts bodily gestures into expressive control signals. So um, here's an excerpt. Announcer voice, anxious voice, Asian voice, authoritative voice, fashion voice, black sounding voice, elegant dishes voice. Project, um, this paper is part of a larger work in progress project on experimental music and posthumanism. Um, posthumanism, I mean, many people have already talked about it, but just um, to kind of situate it, refers to the decentering of the human in relation to technology or animality. Um, it, it's many understand it as the continuation of that line of thinking since its emergence in cybernetics. Um, my title comes, of course, from N. Catherine Hale's 1999 book, How We Became Post-Human, and a critique of it by African-American studies scholar Alexander Wahilia. Um, in that last segment of the Z performance documentation, um, you saw her walk off stage um, behind this projected image of a shower, and then she sings bel canto. Um, so that, um, for me, invokes acousmatics. Um, or a sound whose source is unknown. Um, and because acousmatics is so concerned with the disembodied voice, um, it'll provide an important counterpart in this um, paper to the kinds of hyper-embodiment applied to black subjects across a number of cultural discourses, um, along with responses to those discourses from recent black feminist theories of the human. Um, so, in this paper, um, I analyze the work of Pamela Z in light of recent critiques of posthumanism from sound and music studies and black feminist theories of the human. Z's work has been variously considered through cyborgian, Afrofuturist, and posthumanist discourses. But rather than affirm her practice as fully consonant with technological visions of the posthuman, I argue that she challenges the very liberal humanism upon which the posthuman is built. For a key tenet of liberal humanism, as Wahilia observes, was the racial and gendered apportionment of humanity into full humans, not quite humans, and non-humans. We've never been human, let alone post-human. Um, so Z uses technologies of the embodied voice to confront both the post-human imaginary and the continued effects of its ideological preconditions in ratio-colonial humanism. In another scene, for instance, Z engages the problem of linguistic profiling as it applies to housing discrimination. So against a, ba a, a backdrop of percussive uh, voice sounds, Z explains, quote, studies reveal that people can often infer the race of an individual based on the sound of their voice, end of quote. She then plays back recordings of housing applicants um, containing vocal signifiers of racial difference. <laughs> Following a discussion of the black voice and what Jennifer Stover calls the sonic color line, I'll describe, I'll, I'll describe Z's opera as a narration of the pre-human, human, and post-human. Um, moving with and against these imaginaries, Z attests to how we pay chi hails never became post-human. Um, so some of the most interesting responses to post-humanism come from the interdisciplinary field of black studies, and um, Jaina Brown confirmed this in her amazing keynote yesterday. Um, Zakia Jackson argues, for instance, that, quote, gestures toward the post or the beyond effectively, effectively ignore praxis of humanity and cr critiques produced by black people 
particularly those praxes which are irreverent to the normative production of the human, end of quote. Meanwhile, Wahalia insists that, quote, the post-human frequently appears as little more than the white liberal subject in techno-informational disguise, end of quote. <laughs> Ultimately, through a meeting between the black voice technology and the body, he proposes alternatives to the human by dislodging it from man. The founding of liberal humanism, which composes this notion of man, was also central to the market relations that gave rise to capitalism. In How He Became Post-Human, Hale cites the work of political economist C.B. McPherson, who, like, who locates liberal humanism in the identification of a Cartesian subject as a mind that possesses a body rather than being a body. Through this logic, we arrive at the conditions for, and paradoxically, the results of the legal property relations of liberal, liberal market humanism. These relations laid not only the foundations for capitalism, but also the gendered and racial subjugation inherent to colonialism and slavery. So white supremacy um, was stitched in, into the very fabric of Western humanism. Um, in the words of John Locke, um, every, quote, every man has a property in his own person, end of quote. That man in this formulation represents nothing other than the Western cis heteromasculine white subject is precisely the point. Those who do not conform to these features are rendered in Wahilia's words as, quote, exploitable non-humans, literal legal nobodies, end of quote. One task of a critical black posthumanism then resides in addressing the legacy of this exploitative bodily conscription into captivity. Um, it's interesting then to consider some of the ways black feminist theories of the human foreground the body. Um, so for Hortense Spillers, the new world represents not only a scene of mutilation, dismemberment, and exile, but also a, quote, theft of the body, a willful and violent severing of the captive body from its motive will. For Sylvia Winter, the body appears as an interface between biology and language, the result of what cyberneticists Maturana and Varela define as a languaging living system. Um, so thanks to Sandra for your reading of, your more extended reading of um, Winter earlier today. Um, neither settling for an unreconstructed humanism nor advocating for its unqualified abolishment, Winter calls for its strategic reinvention through a kind of cultural biological feedback loop. Z reimagines the human through musical feedback loops and technologies of the embodied voice. Delays are feedback loops. They've been a mainstay in Z's work ever since she bought an Ibanez DM1000, which, like all delays, works by subjecting an input signal to a recursive feedback circuit. Through this technology, Z has been able to, in her words, find a new voice. In Voci, she uses it to sing and speak a form of meta-commentary on the voice's cultural, historical, and political dimensions. Z's delays, along with the body synth, appear less than as a kind of formal, techno-formal exercise, especially when considered alongside black feminist theories of the human. Given the body synth status as an alternate controller, such a reading even suggests a link between cybernetic control and the, the, the radical notion of control inherent to slavery and colonialism. Um, Norbert Wiener, in fact, um, compares slavery to cybernetics in discussing full machine automation. Um, although sharing most of its ec economic properties, the latter avoids, quote, slavery's direct demoralizing effects of human cruelty, end of quote. The voice and its relationship to the body are central to the black posthumanism Wahilia envisions and which Z, I think, productively protracts through her techno-vocal performances. Wahilia cites the work of Lyndon Barrett, who contends that the black voice has served as a unique form of value within African American culture, not only as an instrument of survival, but as a mode of discursive and extra discursive expression that contrasts with and subverts the white economy of literacy from which black subjects were historically barred. Um, Barrett differentiates between the signing and the singing voice. The former represents synecdochally the white humanist subject through Enlightenment thinkers Hobbes and Locke's sleight of hand, wherein human subjectivity became equated with the ability to read and write. Meanwhile, the singing voice stands for an undoing of the former through the kind of sly alterity heard from slave song spirituals to Billie Holiday. It suggests further for Ahilia, quote, a rather different access to the enlightenment category of humanity and in the process undermines the validity of the white 
uh, of the liberal subject as a quintessence of the human, end of quote. Opposed to a transparent technological authenticity in which the recorded black voice requisitely belongs to a body, and this is Wahalia's um, critical intervention into Barrett's study. Wahalia views the tension therein as a technique of corporeality, um, in, or a kind of um, a strategy uh, of um, embodiment um, inherent to a black posthumanism. So here I want to argue that Z mobilizes such posthuman tactics of embodiment while revoicing tensions pertaining to the black voice and its historical phono-linguistic musical status. In the scene Querty Voice, for instance, Z uses Sprechgesang to gesture towards Barrett's um, signing, singing problematic. <laughs> So given its staging within a multidisciplinary performing arts venue, um, it was performed at the Kitchen and then another uh, venue in San Francisco called the, the uh, ODC um, Theater. Such a scene could be contextualized in light of canonical sound poetry. So think Marinetti, Kirch Fitters, or Cage's uh, Merce Cunningham Mazostics. These artists' works are often said to emphasize the materiality of language at the expense of its signifying properties. Um, yet, given her post-human interfacings between race, gender, and technology, Z's use of the typewriter here connotes, on the one hand, the historically gendered status of this early form of digital labor. Um, as Friedrich Kittler notes, by 1930, the profession was so suffused with women that the very term typewriter referred interchangeably to the machine and its female operator. So a kind of post-human cyborg assemblage, if there ever was one. Um, on the other, Z's vocalizations uh, point to uh, the new world reception of the black voice as an incomprehensible disturbance, um, a reception that continues today in the marginalization of women composers and performers of color in various new, uh, new music and experimental music circles of, of various kinds. In her movement from typographeme to vocal phoneme, furthermore, Z underlines the instability between the written word and its vocalization, shuttling between the signing and singing voice. She employs a kind of subversive perceptual play that turns as much on what is presented as on what is not, um, unable to verifiably match sight to sound, and this is where, um, for me, acousmatics comes back in. Audience, uh, audiences cannot read her typewritten page, um, thus masking the voice's authentic source. Um, a similar phenomenon is at play in voice studies um, where housing discrimination is achieved by matching voice to race. Um, and altogether, such gestures play against the strict authenticity Wahilia criticizes in Barrett's argument while resonating with the techniques of corporeality central to the former's black posthumanism. Okay, so here I want to just sort of shift gears a little bit to consider the black voice from a more historical perspective in this section that I call um, Unhearing the Acousmatic Color Line. Um, an extensive body of scholarship has emerged on the black voice that connects the fields of African American studies, musicology, sound, and performance studies. Um, Jennifer Stover's work stands out for its rigor and inventiveness. Um, the sonic color line is her term for the aural dimension of race, located primarily but not exclusively in the voice. She developed the concept um, from W.E.B. Du Bois's color line, um, itself already an imbrication of optical and geometric metaphors that together describe uh, modernity's racializing discourse and practices. In his um, Watershed 1903 autoethnography, The Souls of Black Folk, Du Bois infamously prophecies that, quote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, end of quote. Du Bois supports this thesis through a variety of scopic metaphors, including blindness, sight, and his recurring figure of the veil. The veil serves as an analog to the color line, um, pointing to black subjects' simultaneous invisibility and hypervisibility while providing a kind of second sight capable of viewing the truths of white hegemony. 
So I want to follow this thread further because it allows us to make some important distinctions around acousmatics and posthumanism. As a way of hearing Du Bois's veil, um, Stover locates a host of acousmatic figurations in Du Bois, including accounts of opera, or sort of acousmatic slash acoustic, I should say, including accounts of opera, screams, wails, silences, and the uh, noises of industry, along with the author's resolute championing of black culture. Music, rather than physical slave labor, Du Bois insists, was the primary accomplishment of black subjects. Musical inscription then becomes a premise for the techniques of embodiment later realized in recording technologies. Um, in this sense, Du Bois posits a black posthumanism avant la lettre. Um, so it wasn't until he became involved with radio production in the 1940s, though, that Du Bois's um, Du Bois's mature thinking on race and technology began to congeal. And initially enamored with radio, Du Bois became disillusioned with the medium as he struggled against uh, censorship, propaganda, and various racial stereotypes. Um, the, the maturation of radio occurred alongside the predominance of uh, liberal ideologies of colorblindness in the post-war U.S. Um, a new form of racism emerged, a colorblind racism that, according to Eduardo Benilla Silva, reframed elements of traditional liberalism, such as work ethic and equal opportunity, for racially illiberal goals. White supremacy had found an accomplice, again, in liberal humanism. With this, it became insufficient to conceive of race as merely an effective ideology to be overcome simply by unseeing it. Moreover, audio technologies, with their implicit acousmatic sense metaphors, even appeared to contribute to racial inequality. Um, not hearing race became tantamount to Baal's um, landlords. Um, this is the um, a linguist that Z refers to, um, who claim similar racial deafness while ruthlessly discriminating against non-white callers. Consequently, for Du Bois, race could no longer be construed as an ideological veil, audible or visible, that could simply be lifted. So aside from the Du Bois, of course, the veil has occupied a, a privileged position in theories of sound and recording technologies, especially from across the Atlantic since the 1950s. Um, Pierre Schaeffer notably invoked the Pythagorean veil in his phenomenological version of acousmatics, which referred to the philosopher's lectures behind a curtain. Um, the critiques of Schaeffer's um, Husserlian reduced listening are numerous. For instance, it's ahistorical, disembodied, and doesn't account for the social. So here I'll add another, or rather sort of augment some of the various critiques based on race and colonialism. Um, as with Du Bois, radio was central to Schaeffer's development, although it resulted in markedly different attitudes towards race. During the 1950s, uh, the early 1950s, alongside his Musique Concrète, Composing, Schaeffer was sent by the French government to repair the infrastructure of the Sorafam uh, radio stations in the African French colonies. This was the first serious effort to supply the co uh, colonies with the technical means for producing radio broadcast, which in a sense helped set the stage for decolonization. Yet, um, indicative of a sedimented Western humanism, Schaeffer's attitude was marked by a profound ambivalence. Quote, Sorafam was an expression of a poetic neo-colonialism and at the same time a rather prosaic form of decolonization. He continues, the history of radio diffusion and political history have been absolutely coincidental, end of quote. It's striking then that Schaeffer would go on to, to elaborate his theory of acousmatic reduction that so strictly excised such a political history from the listener's experience. Schaeffer's entire subsequent orpus, uh, corpus indeed can now be reread as a kind of fatal attempt to unhear a globally inscribed colonial radiophonic color line. Still, it's interesting to consider Schaeffer in light of posthumanism. In Frances Dyson's 2009 Sounding New Media, she describes a Schaeffer who heralds the posthuman through a, quote, benign evolutionary force operating through techniques, end of quote. Schaeffer's 1952 book, Search for a Concrete Music, contains numerous references to information theory along with cybernetics and even artificial intelligence. But considering his broader project, with which empties the acousmatic of its sociocultural meanings, Schaeffer's posthumanism appears to return to um, Wahalia's words, as a mere liberal humanism in techno-informational disguise. For a different version of the posthuman, then let's return to Pamela Z's Voci. So here I want to talk about um, her work's status as opera a bit and how that relates to 
narratives of the human and technology. So opera has always used technology, radio, sound recording, even the telephone allowed um, some late, uh, late 19th century patrons to listen to entire operas from afar. Um, more recently, musicologist Naomi Andre describes her being made aware of the continued use of blackface um, until as recently as 2012 um, via the Met's televisual live and HD series. Um, electronic opera technology takes back as far as the 1803 invention of the limelight, um, highlighting the existing marginalization and typecasting of black opera performers, though uh, such, such technolo technologies nevertheless cast the kinds of penumbra that Andre calls black opera's shadow culture. Um, so I'm going to have to rush through some of this material, but um, what then about the question of narrativity? Um, so there are various um, stories within the acts themselves. I have a, a, a whole kind of um, elaboration on some of the relationships between the founding of opera um, in, in uh, Florentine uh, Italy and sort of the Florentine humanism relationship to liberal humanism. Um, but so uh, I want to just, I want to sort of suggest that this uh, narrative structure emerges in, in the opera um, based on this kind of imbrication of uh, imagined techno-cultural past, presence, and futures um, and sort of in, in this sense um, paralleling Bruce Clark's notion of narrative as a mode of allegory that, as he, as he writes, leaps from one level of signification to another. Um, as a kind of meta-narrative that implicates a viewing, listening, reading audience, Voci, I, I want to argue, sort of leaps from the level of self-contained story to an allegorical staging of the pre-human, human, and post-human. Um, and one of the scenes that I look at, this, this is called Divas. It consists of three different arias being sung simultaneously. Um, so two on, the, on the, the, the two video images that bookend the stage um, are pre-recorded, and then Z sings live in the, in the center there. Um, so I want to suggest that the disparity between this kind of mediated and live performance um, also represents on what I'm calling sort of technologies of the embodied voice. Um, and, and, and also she's singing center stage, which is significant in this um, uh, light of this history of the marginalization and peripheralization of black voices in opera. Um, as the only performer among the three who is given fleshly embodiment, moreover, it's Z's lack of technological mediation that here uh, figures as an exemplary technique of corporeality. Um, Divas, this section, um, enacts what Naomi Andre refers to as downstaging. She, quote, brings black perspectives and experiences downstage in our narrative of how the story is told and who is telling and interpreting the story, end of quote. So Z reclaims the centrality of this narrative, ultimately re-narrating the human through a critical black post-humanism. And I'll end it there. Thank you so much.